to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Well, listeners, welcome back to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. It's great to be with you again this week. I'm Josh Hawkins, and as always, I'm here with Bill Schofield and John Harrigan. Hey, guys, how you doing? Good, man. It's good. We're, I'm good. Thanks. Great, great. Well, as we've been saying the past few episodes, our goal in this third season of our show is to help you understand how Second Temple Jews, how Jesus and the apostles understood and interpreted the Tanakh apocalyptically. So we began with some introductory ideas about the Tanakh and how it's commonly read, how it often leads to supersessionism, uh, but we've started our walkthrough of the themes and the ideas that make up the apocalyptic hermeneutic of Jesus and the apostles. Yeah, last episode we, um, we talked about Genesis 3, Genesis 6, and Genesis 11, and the trifecta uh, of the... Uh, of the transgressions of the <laughs> earth against God and kind of his response of the limitation he put on humanity kind of progressively. And then the, then the promise that accompanied the limitation and the, and the whole pattern that, that essentially forms how we think about redemptive history now. Yeah. So today we're going to do um, kind of in light of that, the, uh, Abraham and the Bible's description of him as kind of the antidote for uh, global rebellion and uh, the main expression of the Tower of Babel being idolatry among all the nations, the table of nations, and, uh, <clears throat> and that Abraham is led out of that into the worship of uh, the true God. And so, we, you know, we, we get a lot of uh, descriptions of that in Jewish apocalyptic literature, and which plays into the New Testament and how the, the presuppositions of uh, Jewish election and how God relates to the Gentiles, to the nations in relation to the seed of Abraham and the Jews. And that becomes particularly evident with Paul yep the Jewish apostle to the Gentiles. So Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Well, if you recall, if you've been listening to us all the way back from season one, we did a short episode. This was season one, episode six on Paul's gospel and Jewish election. And we've talked about some of these themes a little bit all the way back in episode six of season one. Uh, and the other thing that we highlighted last episode uh, was a super helpful course by some of our friends at the ARC Network, uh, David Gordon and David Rickman, and uh, their, their course called Studies in Torah uh, yeah. really sets the foundation for the Jewish apocalyptic redemptive narrative of the scriptures and uh, and really setting up the election of Abraham. So would highly re uh, recommend you go and check out that course. We'll leave a link in the show notes below. Um, yeah. But today, again, we're talking about election. Okay, we're talking about the election of Abraham. And first of all, before we kind of get into this, into the nitty gritty of it, guys, like, I think it's important, like we've talked about so much before, to say what we're not meaning, what we're not saying, um, that when we talk about the election of Abraham, we have to understand it as God choosing or electing Abraham for a role or purpose in relation to redemptive history, okay? And we're not talking about the common word, maybe when people hear the word election, if you're from a more reformed background or a Calvinistic context, you may think, oh, election for eternal life, God saving someone effectually or effectively for eternal life. And that is not what we're talking about here. Hellenistic eternal life, you mean? Yeah. It, <laughs> Hellenistic right. eternal life. Yeah, it, it's it's super annoying it, it's it, it is Christian history. Christian history is kind of like history of hijacking biblical words so yep. that nobody knows what you're talking about. Right. And this is a great example. Yep. Yep. So as you said, John, as we get into this now, the context of election is 
the Tower of Babel, right? What happened at the Tower of Babel? Well, a whole bunch of humanity decided, let's build a tower whose top reaches the heavens, and let's see if we can get the Elohim on our side. Let's make a name for ourselves. Let's see if we can perpetuate immortality, as we talked about in our last episode in Genesis 3, 6, and 11. Uh, And this sets us up for Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and the election of Abraham. Right. And and so... Yeah, so the election of Abraham, that's that's the that's the whole point, is that if you is that it's a crucial part of the narrative. So following from chapter three, chapter six, and chapter eleven, um I, I mean the amount of history that's actually told during that period is relatively small. It just focuses on these rebellious periods. And then but then right. it picks up with the family of Abraham and the point is, is that uh, that in one way or another, Babel seems to be the beginning of what would later be known as just idolatry, worshiping the gods of the nations. And so Abraham is just presented, his, his election is presented as, like John said, the antidote for that. And so what we'll look at a little bit today is Jewish apocalyptic tradition so much, so many of the Jewish stories, um, extra biblical stories about Abraham, are just elaborating on his turning away from idols. You know, highlighting a little bit from from the Book of Joshua how he was uh, he his he, his father was an idol maker, and so there's going to be a lot of stories about that. But like, um, I think of like here's a really elaborate one. It's actually really common in in Jewish literature to place Abraham back as a young man at the Tower of Babel. Some of them even place him as the as the arch nemesis for Nimrod, and they kind of get into fights, and that's another story. But yeah. uh, but uh, pseudo Philo in Biblical Antiquities uh, chapter six um, tells a story about some young men, including Abraham, who are basically kind of drafted to start placing bricks and mortar to build their part of the wall of the Tower of Babel. And so in verse 4, it says, And the princes said to them, Wherefore would ye not set every man your bricks with the people of the land? Goodness, this is a rough translation. (laughs) And they answered and they said, We will not set bricks with you, Neither will we be joined with your desire. One Lord know we, (laughs) and and him do we worship. And if you should cast us into the fire with your bricks, we will not consent to you. Anyway, so Abraham basically takes a stand and says, we worship one God. We're not going to help build this tower to worship other gods. And later on in verse 17, they throw him in a furnace, kind of like, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fire in the furnace is super hot, but the fire jumps out of the window of the furnace, and it kills 135,000 people who are actually engaged in worshiping idols, and then Abraham walks out without uh, a singed hair, and the building, the uh, the furnace collapses behind him. Think of uh, think of the uh, a cheesy 70s action film where the explosion... Totally the end of the movie it's as he struts out. In the background. So, but these stories... <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> but these stories are kind of... This is, this is, you know, one of the more exciting ones. But they basically... What is highlighted in a way to defend what, what almost seems in chapter 12 as like a kind of a random election is that, no, he's chosen because of his explicit rejection throughout his life of idolatry. And this is what defines in the Jewish mind going forward, why is Abraham chosen to bless the nations? Because he won't worship idols like they will. Yeah. And not, I mean, not all of the, you know, the narratives of Abraham are quite as far-fetched. Like if you take the book of Jubilees, for example, it's uh, it's almost verbatim the book of Genesis. It, it's pretty mundane. Boring. Yeah, it's pretty mundane. There's not. I mean, there is. You know, one chapter where he celebrates the the uh, feast of tabernacles, which is a little <laughs> anachronistic. Um, but a great example of uh, what's basically going on in most 
references to Abraham is the Apocalypse of Abraham, where they're Jews are trying to take the narrative of the Torah and put it within the larger redemptive framework, which is the Day of Judgment. And so most of the apocalyptic literature just takes the historical narrative and adds some things like angelic encounters and visitations in which the angel reveals the larger redemptive picture and the coming judgment of the nation. So the Apocalypse of Abraham is great like that in that it's 32 chapters long. The first eight chapters are Abraham and his father arguing about idolatry. And um, and then Abraham breaks with him. And chapters 9 through 32 are a, a an apocalypse or a revelation in the style of Ezekiel 1 or Isaiah 6 or Revelation 4. It's got that same kind of feel where Abraham is taken up into the heavens He's shown the heavenly uh, the throne room. He's shown the nations. He's shown pictures of Eden and the judgment to come. And so as it kind of retells the Genesis narrative, it adds uh, angels along the way. And it, it recounts his calling uh, to be a blessing to the nations. It recounts Genesis 15 which is where the covenant happens with the with the uh, sacrifice of the animals and the smoking pot and the and so in Apocalypse of Abraham in chapter fifteen it retells Genesis fifteen and so it says and it came to pass when the sun was setting and behold a smoke like that of a furnace and the angels who had divided the portions of the sacrifice ascended on top of the furnace of smoke. So it adds angels into the picture. And the angel took me with his right hand and set me on the wing of the pigeon and he on the wing of the turtle dove as if they weren't slaughtered, which I'm not sure about the translation there. But it says, Then he carried me up to the edge of the fiery flames, and we ascended as if carried by many winds to the heavens that's fixed in the expanses, and I saw on the air to those to whose height we had ascended a strong light which cannot be described. And behold, in this light a fiery Gehenna was enkindled, and a great crowd in the likeness of men, and they were all changing in aspect and shape, running and changing in form, and prostrating themselves and crying aloud words I did not know. So you get kind of a, a picture of the judgment of the nations that God is calling Abraham out of this idolatry that's going to lead to the coming fire. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, John, I mean, even with all of these stories in Second Temple literature about Abraham, the whole point is Abraham was chosen as the guy who's going to lead the nations out of idolatry because he refused to participate in worshiping other gods. And of right. course, you know, while these aren't biblical stories, they show us that this was how they had already connected the fact that this is the reason why Abraham was chosen, why he was elected, uh, and and it was because he refused to participate in idolatry. Yeah, exactly, Josh. Th- this is basically how, coming into the New Testament, that's why this conversation about Abraham picks up, in, and it's in context to the Gentiles. And you get, you get this real explicitly in Acts 13, when, uh, so Paul and Barnabas are in, um, uh, Pisidian Antioch. Pisidian Antioch, that's right. And, and so they go in and it says the first Sabbath they're there, everybody loves what they're saying. And the second Sabbath, it says, you know, almost the whole city gathers, which is, you know, exaggeration, but basically a bunch of Gentiles come. A yeah. bunch of Gentiles come. And the this is when the the elders of the synagogue grow uncomfortable, probably not because of the message, probably because of the dynamic of Paul essentially telling all these Gentiles to stop worshiping idols. Because right. every other case we have Paul addressing Gentiles directly, he's confronting idolatry. And so, and the implications of their relation with Rome because of such a large number of Gentiles refusing to worship the gods of the cities, refusing to offer the incense to Caesar, like that's super intense for the synagogue. And so they uh, begin to malign uh, 
Paul and Barnabas and, and try to discredit what they're saying. And this is where you have this famous statement. It's the first time it's used, but he says it three more times in the book of Acts. He says, very well, um, Barnabas and I are going to the Gentiles because this is what God has commanded us, saying, a light to the nations I have made you. And so what he's saying there, he's not saying that God has commanded me and Barnabas. He's saying God has commanded our nation, our people, our family, to call the nations out of their darkness into the light of worshiping the God of Israel and serving him exclusively. Yeah, he's quoting Isaiah 49, right? <clears throat> Isaiah 49. Quoting Isaiah 49, verse 6. Right. Um, it's not enough that you should just call forth the remnant of the nation of Israel, but I, I will raise you up to be a, uh, a light to the nations as well. Right. So, so anyway, so that's where you get, they understand Jewish election in terms of calling the nations out of idolatry. Right. And this, you know, the, a great example of this is in chapter 17 when Paul is in at Mars Hill in Athens and you have completely ignorant Gentiles. They have no, they've had no discipleship in the scriptures or the knowledge of God. And Paul just does a real brief survey of redemptive history as a whole, starting with creation, God allowing all the, all the nations to go their own way and to worship idols, right. but now he commands all the Gentiles, the nations, to repent because he said a day when he'll judge the world with justice by the man he's appointed, and he's proven it by raising him from the dead. And so you get just a, a super concise synopsis that of what Paul's mission was, was to call the Gentiles Absolutely. to stop worshiping idols and repent and flee the wrath to come. Right, just a real basic, straightforward, which is kind of uh, uh, a, it, it's it it exemplifies how Paul viewed his mission to the Gentiles, the big picture yeah. of what he was trying to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this was actually one of our early, very early episodes in season one where we talked about this in season one, episode three. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I think that, yeah. you know, we didn't talk too much about the election of Abraham in that context, from what I recall. It's been a while since we recorded that episode. But, uh, but that's really what we're trying to tie all of this to now, is to say why and how did the apostles, how did Second Temple literature interpret the election of Abraham? It was for the sake of calling the nations out of idolatry in light of the day of judgment, right? right. And, and this is how this plays out in the New Testament. This is how the apostles understand it. This is how Jesus understands it. This is how uh, Second Temple authors understand it, right? And uh, I think this can lead us to even a passage that is often misunderstood because it's almost as if Paul is seen as God unelecting Israel. This is the classic Galatians 3, right? And uh, in Galatians 3, we, we get this, I mean, several other passages in Paul as well, but this is a common one from Paul where Paul is said, well, Abraham is said to be the father of many nations. And so what's the deal with this? Well, election doesn't seem to be a thing anymore. Like Abraham's just the father of a whole bunch of kind of a new de-ethnicized uh, universal group of people, as is commonly interpreted. Um, but is that what's going on in Galatians 3? Uh, I would say probably not. Yeah, probably not. Um, yeah, so Galatians 3 is, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, there's so much, I mean, I mean, people hang so much on Galatians 3 in Christian tradition. It's, it's definitely, you know, fighting territory if you want to mess with Galatians 3. But, um, like, this is this is not real difficult to understand um, in light of, you know, the, the biblical narrative about Abraham. Like, even in, uh, like, just real straightforward in, in Genesis 17, uh, surrounding the story of circumcision and the story of, uh, you know, Abraham's name change. That might be, you know, some, something we can we can hang right there. Yeah. So he changes his name, if you remember right, because he says, you're not just going to be the father of one family, but you're going to be the father of a multitude of Gentiles, a multitude of Goyim. And later, you know, that would often be translated as, or interpreted as Gentiles. But so the idea that Abraham is the father of many nations is doesn't come at the expense 
of him being elect or his family having a particular role. This actually is a reiteration of his role. Yeah. As the as kind of like the tribal chief of many nations. And this is this is kind of the whole context for election is that Abraham isn't blessed to be blessed. He's blessed to be a nation. And his family isn't raised up for his family. His family is raised up for the others. And so, like we were talking about, uh, we, what we've emphasized up to now is idolatry. And then Abraham learning to worship the God of Israel, the, the creator, the God of gods, on his own terms versus the terms or protocols of the gods of the nations. And that's essentially what's going on in the first century movement with the apostles. But the other thing that's emphasized about Abraham, both through, you know, uh, Jewish tradition and real explicitly in the New Testament, is Abraham's faith. And Galatians 3, that's what you get, is Abraham's faith becomes emblematic of what we're actually calling the Gentiles to. Yeah. As the father... Uh, uh, as the as the one that God has called as the father of a multitude of nations, this is the way we come into kind of submission to God's plan. As we look at Abraham, not only in his turning from idols, but his turning to God in faith. And uh, uh, Ben Sirah, uh, chapter 44, <clears throat> there's like a narrative about Abraham, but in chapter 44, he, he tells it like this, starting in verse 19. Abraham was the great father of a multitude of nations, and no one has been found like him in glory. He kept the law of the Most High and entered into a covenant with him. He certified the covenant in his flesh. When he was tested, he proved faithful. Therefore, the Lord assured him with an oath that the nations would be blessed through his offspring. So he was faithful when he was tested. Therefore, the Lord assured him with an oath that the nations would be blessed with an offspring. So the Lord's reiteration in chapter 17 is him going, you were, you did it. When I tested you, you kept proving loyal and that you would trust me. And so I, he, Lord reiterates the oath that the nations would be blessed and that he would make him as numerous as the dust of the earth and exalt his offspring like the stars. So um, very important. Abraham's election and his family's election is for everyone else. It's not so that they can be special. It's a subject that is related to not only calling the nations out of idolatry, but but teaching them and modeling for them the path that actually is pleasing to God, which like John was reading earlier is exemplified in Genesis 15, which is this path of hearing God's voice, trusting him, acting in obedience, and God going, well done. I, I consider this righteousness yeah. for humans to act this way. So this is the other way that Abraham kind of exemplifies what it means to, uh, to call the Gentiles out of darkness. Yeah, and I think, you know, just uh, not to say a lot about Galatians 3 because things get complicated, but Paul's main point is like Romans 4. He's simply saying that Jew and Gentile like are justified, acquitted before the before God in the coming judgment on the basis of faith. And yep. and wow. that's 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 all he's saying. He's not uh, saying because what usually gets read is that Jews are like particularistic right. and God yeah, has a universalistic right. heart. And so yeah. Paul is arguing in Galatians 3 against particularism for universalism. And that's just not in Paul's mind at all. Jews were universalistic yeah. in the fir- first yeah. century. But they viewed that universalism through Jewish particularism, which is right. the election of Israel for the administration of redemptive history, God's redemptive history for all the nations. And so there's no need to set those against themselves. And when Paul is saying in Galatians 3 that God proclaimed the gospel beforehand to Abraham, that he would justify the Gentiles on the same basis as the Jews— He's simply saying that God ordained the, the, the salvation of the Gentiles by means of Abraham, by means of the Jews. 
And so it's, it's the same faith of Abraham that the Gentiles are now imitating and that God is justifying them also. There's, there's nothing in Galatians 3 that even remotely suggests that God has reversed the election of the Jews. It's, that's just something read into the text uh, uh, that is that is kind of presupposed, particularly after the Enlightenment. I think of uh, uh, Joel Kaminsky's book. Yet, uh, what's that one? What's it called? Uh, yet, yet I have yet oh, Jacob yeah. I have loved. Uh, mm, yeah. And so he does that. You know that whole uh, first section on basically it's a presupposition of post enlighten Enlightenment Westernism that that has a penchant for universals. That universality is by nature superior to particularism, and that that's where we get the thrust against uh, 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 racism, the accusation of racism mm. in relation yeah. to the election of, of Israel is that particularism is by nature philosophically in superior. Uh, inferior. And so I think a lot of that, you know, just kind of plays into, but none of that was in, you know, first century Jews mind. It was normal that God would, you know, every, every people, every city's God chose that people in that city in relation to their divine agenda. Israel's God chose this people in relation to his divine agenda. It's just that Israel's God is the true God that's actually going to judge the living and the dead. He's actually the one who created everything. He's actually the one who's going to end everything. And so that's good. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Why, yeah. why reference Abraham at all if Abraham don't matter? Right. Right. <laughs> why, why, is, why would he be the reference point? <laughs> I mean, if this really is about some spiritualization where there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor female, and if that's what Paul was saying was some sort of, okay, this is really about some universalized people now, and there's no more role distinction. And apparently then, gender fluid as well. Well, yeah, exactly. Right? Like, <laughs> well, clearly. And he would say it. This is, this right. is like, this is like realized eschatology. If right. you're going to say it, it would be like the Nag Hammadi library where you say it <laughs> real clear and then right. you would explain it and then you give examples and metaphors and then you say it again real clear. You don't yeah, make yeah, like right. a few passing references, like one verses here and there, and you never actually say it. If Paul's right. saying it, he would say it. So if he's yeah, saying totally. that God is de-ethnicized and is, is, he would say it real clear directly and then he would explain it and then say it again. But he actually <laughs> says it real clear, for example, in Romans 11, that he's not saying it. Right. Yeah, that it exactly. it's absolutely can't happen. Yeah, but right. somehow we read back in to a few particular verses that Paul is this revolutionary universalist. <laughs> it's yep. re redrawing all the lines of covenant. And right. it's just like, okay. right. that's exactly. insanity, literally. It yeah. is. Yeah, really is. Well, and I think this can bring us to maybe just a concluding passage for today's episode, which really makes a lot of sense in light of everything we've been talking about, and it's Romans 15, just because it brings in a lot of what we were just talking about. It brings in Abraham and what God has promised, all of that through this. So I'll just read this Romans 15, 8 and 9, for I tell you that the Messiah became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Then he goes off and he quotes some uh, passages from the Tanakh. The root of Jesse is going to come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles in him will the Gentiles hope. And so then may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in relying or believing or trusting so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would abound in hope. Hope for what? Hope that God is going to do what he said for Abraham in the election of Abraham and blessing the nations through that particular family line. Yeah, I think this is, you know, this is how Paul viewed his priestly service in uh, in verse 16, his priestly service of the gospel of God, and so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And so he's all he's saying is that his mission to the Gentiles is to get them to repent of their idolatry, to flee the wrath to come, 
to worship the true God, the God of Israel, and put their faith in the King of the Jews and the Messiah, right? And so it's not like a big complicated redefinition of everything. Paul is simply functioning as an intermediary Jewish apostle to see Gentiles saved from the wrath to come. So, you know, in that light, Paul's view of the harmony between Jew and Gentile is based on the Gentiles understanding God's mercy to them in light of the promises to the patriarchs. So right. if, okay. if, and that's what Paul is trying to fix, is that you have the situation in Rome where Gentiles are not recognizing the promises to the patriarchs. They're saying that the promises to the patriarchs are revocable, that God's no longer the God of Israel. And Paul is coming back in Romans 11 saying, no, that it's the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, and the Jews are loved on account of the forefathers, and that harmony between Jew and Gentile now in you know what Mark Kinzer calls uh, bilateral ecclesiology, that Jews and Gentiles walk out their salvation with fear and trembling in light of the coming judgment in different ways, but you don't, uh, you don't use those different ways of, you know, discipleship and election in this age to accuse one another. And so if Gentiles, right. if Gentiles don't understand the patriarchal promises, then they're not going to be able to walk in harmony and rejoice in the mercy of God being extended to them. That's what gives yeah. context yeah. for chapter 15 and the harmony that Paul wants to see. And I know we're wrapping up here, but you just, you just, prompted me so I, I have to <laughs> I have to just say it so I remember I remember uh what was it like a year and a half ago you and I we were going back I don't remember if we were talking or we were on whatsapp or what was happening but we were talking about this passage and talking about the collection and how the collection that Paul's taking up from the Gentiles to Jerusalem is actually quite mind-blowing the collection's <clears throat> unbelievable. <laughs> it is, and it seems like such a like a side story, but it's like what he's doing with the Gentiles, anticipating the age to come, and basically in anticipation of like Isaiah 60 and 61, when the Gentiles bring their wealth to the city of Jerusalem, like he's taking these collections and he's bringing them to Jerusalem. I mean, it's just, it's so incredible the way he's thinking about it. And it's like, it's always seen as like a little bit of a side story. Oh yeah. And by the way, let's take some money for the people there. Just, you know, whatever, whatever the Lord puts on your heart. But <laughs> right. It's like, it's like a charity. It's like right, a charity exactly. donation. But, but it comes up in nearly <laughs> every letter. Like it's so important to him and then you yeah. get a little bit of commentary here in Romans 15 of why it's so important. It's the offering of the Gentiles that is that it has such theological significance, both to the brothers in Jerusalem as a statement to them of, of what God is doing among the Gentiles. These are the Gentiles from Isaiah 60, in other words, but also to the brothers, the Gentile brothers who are giving the offering. You guys are also the Gentiles from Zechariah 14. And in Zechariah 14 is when you have the it's, the, it's the statement after the day of the Lord, when the Lord returns and the day of judgment. And it'll come to pass on that day that all the nations that don't come up and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And now there's a lot of tradition now around Feast of Tabernacles. It didn't exist back then. But in the biblical period... The, the Feast of Tabernacles is a celebration of the of of or remembrance of the time in the wilderness. And if you look back in the prophets like Hosea, the period of the wilderness is the period of election. It is where God chose them and made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai. And so really, Zechariah 14 is this intense statement, such a reversal from the present age that any Gentile participants in the world to come will come and eat the humble pie of going up every year to celebrate that God yeah. chose Abraham's family of all the families and every year. And if Egypt, yeah. John, eye on you over there and your, right. and your peeps, <laughs> Egypt, if you guys don't come up and celebrate Jewish election, 
the fact that I chose Abraham and his descendants at Mount Sinai, then rain won't fall on your land that year. You'll have drought. Even in the age to come, God will withhold the rain. So intense. But this is the narrative. This is the narrative. And this is why Jew, like the election of Abraham and his family is not a side issue. Right. I, and our discussion around that was because we were, uh, I was, as a, as a team here, we were, uh, we were preaching through Second Corinthians. And so I had Second Corinthians 8 and 9. And, and it just blew my mind because Paul's point in Romans 15 is um, they, all the Gentiles from Macedonia, Achaia, uh, they're pleased to do it. They owe it to them. Right. For if the Gentiles have come to right. share in their spiritual blessing, they ought also to be a service in their material blessing. And so Paul's point is that he used the Jerusalem offering, which was it, it had quite an intensity of scale, to uh, to reinforce the discipleship, the orientation of the discipleship of the Gentiles. And long story short, at the end, my application was that uh, when when uh, when Muslims come to the Lord, they need to be discipled early to give financially to. Uh, to messianic Jewish ministries in the land, and uh, and it yeah. it just kind of it kind of dropped like a dead fish, and uh, and I was talking, <laughs> and I was talking to one of you know our our, our uh, Egyptian brothers here afterwards, and I asked him, you know, what what would it take for one of the major uh, churches, Egyptian churches here? Uh, to do that, to do a concerted effort to give to Messianic um, ministries in Israel. And he just looked at me, he said, never, <laughs> never could it happen. He said, it's beyond impossible, beyond impossible. Wow. It could never, never happen. He said beyond impossible like four wow. times. And so it wow. really is like it, it's... And that was Paul's point, is that he wanted to see the humiliation yeah. of the Gentiles to reorient so that they didn't become spiritually arrogant in their understanding of redemptive history, that God would actually choose to administrate redemptive history on the basis of election according to an ethnicity. And that's real hard for us. There's no doubt. Yeah. It's real hard for people before the Enlightenment. It's super hard after the right. Enlightenment. Yeah, right. So, yeah. And yeah. super hard on top of that, geopolitical, all the dynamics and history. And so a lot of it really is just praying for the Holy Spirit to the to, to grant hope and joy and peace and believing and the hope of the God of Israel. It it, it takes Amen. the Holy Spirit uh, to reverse a lot of that. Amen. Yeah. Well, guys, this is super rich, really awesome. Hopefully, listeners, this has been provoking to you. And we want to continue with Abraham next week, actually. And uh, there's more that we can talk about because Second Temple literature and the New Testament develops Abraham more than just along the lines of election. But his faith, I mean, we you alluded to a little earlier, Bill, but the fact that his faith is what's also highlighted throughout Second Temple literature and in the New Testament is something, really his faith for eternal life and the resurrection and uh, and the, the restoration of all things, blessing, returning, all of that. So we want to take another episode next week and talk about Abraham along these lines and, and develop this more from Second Temple literature as well. So we hope, listeners, you've been provoked and encouraged by this week, and uh, we are looking forward to our episode next time. So until then, God bless and Maranatha. 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 Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel. 